Hi, welcome to the Baseball Nation show here at SB Nation's YouTube channel. I'm Rob Nyer. And I'm Grant Brisby. And Grant, we have so many topics, great topics to talk about this week that uh, I'm going to mention just in passing that the Red Sox have lost seven straight. John Henry went to Seattle on a fact-finding mission, whatever that is, and he did say that uh, Bill James um, is going to play a larger role than he has the last few seasons, all of which I find fascinating. But we're going to skip right past the Red Sox and first talk about the New York Yankees, who uh, bizarrely um, have seen their, their big lead in the AL East shrink to just, uh, as of Monday, Tuesday morning, uh, one game over the Orioles, two and a half over the Rays. And there is a, uh, a, a minor but still a, a reasonable uh, chance that the Yankees could actually fall completely out of the playoffs this season. I think this is a, a bizarre and unexpected story. It's not very Yankees-like, that's for sure. I mean, with the Yankees, their, their run of success, even the one year where they didn't make the playoffs, it's not like they had a, a collapse at the end. They just weren't very good and, and kind of lagging behind all season. So the way that they're doing it now, where they had just a huge insurmountable lead that's slowly, slowly being chipped away at, um, that's not very Yankees-like. And what, what's weird is that it's so easy to see the separation between their um, July where everything was working right, they, they won 20 games, and everything else. I mean, it seems like the months surrounding, you know, you get your June, your August, pr pretty much the same kind of month. They're not bad. They're just not great like they were in July. So it's, it's funny to see them slowly, slowly kind of getting that lead chip away. Yeah, and Stephen Goldman uh, wrote a great piece for us at Baseball Nation uh, on Tuesday about the Yankees season and the weird separations that you mentioned. They were 21 and 21 in their first 42 games. And then from May 22nd through July, June 27th, 25 and 7. And since then, 30 and 30. So they basically have been a 500 team except for that 32 game stretch in, in late May and June. Uh, those are arbitrary endpoints, of course. Uh, but um, it's just not a great team. As you said, they're a good team, but not a great team. They have some weaknesses. Raul Abanez is Raul Abanez, excuse me is uh, is uh, not that good. Ichiro hasn't done much since he joined the Yankees. Um, it's just not an exciting, great team. Yes, they're probably going to make the playoffs uh, still, uh, but they there's no reason to consider them big favorites to, for the World Series, which I think a lot of people would have would have assumed just um, uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, I mean they were. They've been hurt by injuries, of course, you know, to Cher being out and, and Alex Rodriguez being out for an extended period of time. I think once you get the, the lineup back to the way it was supposed to be, it'll look a lot better. I think in late August they had weird things like, like Steve Pierce hitting cleanup and, and just kind of overall funkiness. They've been hit, as you'd expect, with, with sort of an old team, uh, hit with a lot of injuries. I think things will start looking a little bit better towards the end of September. Um, it, you know, hopefully for them it wouldn't be too late. Um, I, I still, I don't know, I, I, I get caught in between the, the gray area of trying to be you know, real analytical and real rational about it, but it's also hard for me to, to not look at the Yankees and, and figure, no, nah, they're going to pull it out. I mean, they never collapse. Uh, for whatever reason, the Yankees just always seem to, to pull through. They always seem to have a, uh, a Bartolo Colon or a Freddy Garcia that comes out of nowhere and, and does good things for a team that you know, seems to get all the luck. Uh, at least in the regular season. So I'm kind of caught in between of them, the analytical side, thinking that they're going to you know, maybe not have the best team down the stretch, but also thinking, eh, it's the Yankees. They'll come through. Well, they probably, they probably will. And uh, they, they're fighting with the Orioles and the Rays for the AL East, but they have a two-and-a-half game lead over the Rays, which, which does mean something at this point in the season, two-and-a-half games as of, of Tuesday morning. Um, Two and a half games does mean something. They're just a game ahead of the Orioles, but uh, I still can't help thinking that the Orioles are going to, if not collapse, at least find their own level. This is still a team that's been outscored, um, and it's just hard to see them playing this well uh, above their run differential for an entire season. But when you get to this point, um, it really 
Uh, I'd be love to see a study sometime of you know, different points in the season. What, where do you rank the factors um, that determine who wins? Um, but I have to think that at this point in the season, the most important thing is luck. And the second most important thing is schedule. And the third most important thing is how good you actually are with, with roughly um, less than 30 games left to play. And when you factor all those things in, um, it's very difficult to say, oh, this team's better, so they're going to win. Well, in a month, who knows? Anything could happen. So it's certainly it's, it's quite conceivable, though still unlikely, that the Yankees would miss the playoffs completely, along with the Red Sox, of course, which would be a, a bizarre situation. Yeah, absolutely. When was the last time the Yankees and the Red Sox both missed the, the playoffs? Uh, I believe that would have been 1995. Is that possible? That seems seems right to me, but I, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, that's good amazing. Good question. I wish I, had, I wish I had the right answer for it. Uh, <laughs> maybe that is the right answer. I don't know. Um, next topic today is the uh, National League wild card, which... Uh, uh, for some reason, I found fascinating for a while. I think in part because the Cardinals had such a great run differential but couldn't get ahead of the Pirates. Um, the Braves, for a while, were just sort of going up and down. But right now, the Braves look really good. I mean, they've got um, a big lead in the wild card standings. Um, but that, that second spot, I shouldn't say big. It's a three-game lead over the Cardinals. But the Braves just look solid to me. And if they don't win the first one, I think they'll win the second wild card. Uh, the second one is still is still open. You have the Cardinals, um, who haven't, despite the best run differential in the league, um, never have been, been able to put any distance between themselves and the other clubs. Um, but uh, uh, they're in the lead for the second wild card. Uh, they're a half a game ahead of the Dodgers, two and a half ahead of the Pirates. And it looks to me like the Pirates, by the way, finally are finding you know, they're sort of pre- season level. In fact, I'm a little worried about the Pirates because uh, while it's always seemed like they might fall out of the playoff race, um, they did seem pretty well assured of having their first winning season since, I believe, 1992. Uh, but now, as of Tuesday morning, they're six games over, and it's not inconceivable that they could actually fall below 500 before the end of the season. That would be so depressing. I mean, I, for me, the Pirates are sentimental favorites just because I'm, they've been so bad for so long. But yeah, I, I think there was a point in July or August where I was thinking, well, you know, if they don't make the playoffs, at least you're going to finish over 500. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, that, that's, it's really impressive and hard to do for 20 years not to have a, a winning season at all, not to fluke into a winning season, not to have a season where you're outscored but still somehow manage to finish with 82 wins. Um, I still think they have a chance. I mean, I think McCutcheon going back to the player that he was instead of some sort of super robotic MVP candidate, I think that's kind of expected, but you still have players like Pedro Alvarez kind of picking up some of the slack. Uh, Travis Snyder's been doing okay since he he came over. Uh, And they're they're a team that's built on their pitching, both the rotation and and the bullpen. I I still think they have a, a shot. I mean, obviously they have a shot. They're just a couple games out of the second wild card spot. But I don't think they are the 90 lost pirates that I figured they'd be before the season started. Uh, so I still think that they have a reasonable chance. And like you're saying, when it, when it comes down to that last month, luck has a lot to do with it, maybe even more so than the, the strength of the team. You know, this, they remind me a little bit of the, uh, of the 2003 Royals who had a big lead in their division at the all-star break. And they, like the pirates, the Royals really tried. The Royals made moves. They, 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 they worked on making, getting the bullpen better. They, um, they traded for Reggie Sanders, who had a big September for them. I mean, they made moves to try to win. It just didn't work out. They did finish above 500, but just barely 83 and 79. And it looks to me like that's what's going to happen to the Pirates. I mean, I'm pulling for them as you are. Uh, and by the way, I should mention, uh, when I said that the Cardinals had the best run differential in the National League, I misspoke. Uh, the Nationals have the best run differential. The Cardinals do have the best run differential in the NL Central, although it's not doing them any good. They're eight and a half games behind the Reds. Uh, but I, 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 and look, we saw last year what going to happen in September. Um, so it's fool, it would be foolish to say uh, the Cardinals are going to win because they have a great run differential. It doesn't mean anything at this point. But if I have to bet, I like the Cardinals. And then I think that the other tough, tough one to figure out is, uh, though is, is 
are the Dodgers going to come back and catch the Cardinals for that second wild card spot, assuming the Pirates don't? Um, we're still sort of waiting for the Dodgers, all that talent that they've acquired, to really show up. Uh, they're now four and a half behind the Giants in the NL West, and that might not even be close. That season ending series might not even matter. Uh, but you keep thinking the Dodgers' talent, all those guys they've acquired, is really going to make them uh, tough to beat. Um, and I can still see them catching the Dodgers, can't you? Or the, I should say the Cardinals. Yeah, I can. I mean, the Dodgers are, are playing. Uh, they, they've had two uh, walk-off wins in a row uh, on Saturday and, and Monday against uh, uh, in the late innings against the Diamondbacks and the Padres. Adrian Gonzalez makes them a better team. I'm not sure how much better Josh Beckett makes them, if he makes them better at all. Um, I still think they, they're a flawed team. They're not as good as they, they were in the beginning of the season, obviously. But, yeah, they still have a great shot. I mean, that, when you look at that middle of the lineup now, you know, what started in the beginning of the season as Kemp and Ethier and just nothing else, and then you add Adrian Gonzalez and Hayden hey, Ramirez, you know, forget what they're going to be paying to whomever in 2018. That foursome in the middle is is pretty pretty scary. And when you've got guys doing on base percentage things like uh, uh, the Ellis's, AJ and Mark uh, around them, they're they're a pretty good team. I don't know if they're as complete a team as the Cardinals, especially if they're going to be missing Chad Billingsley or Kenley Jansen uh, for an extended period of time. But they're a pretty complete team. I could see them. Certainly catching the Cardinals, even though I, I think the Cardinals might be a more complete team. Uh, I, I'm a little bit more comfortable with the talent they've accumulated. Uh, just I, I trust the Cardinals team a little bit more to, to win, but Dodgers are, are no joke. They could certainly take that second wild card, if not the first. Yeah, yeah they, they could. Um, and I think that's going to be the race to watch this month is Cardinals versus Dodgers for that second wild card of the I, National League. Next week, we'll get to the American League wild card, which is fascinating. The A's just won 9 out of 10 um, and uh, have been truly interesting. But we'll talk about the AL wild card next week for sure. Uh, right now, I want to talk about, the, about the, uh, one of the top prospects in all of baseball, um, probably one of the top three prospects. Uh, the Rangers' Jurickson Profar, great shortstop, um, was called up last weekend. In his first at bat, 19 years old. In fact, I believe he debuted at exactly the same age as, like to the day, exactly the same age as Bryce Harper. So Harper is not the only 19 year old phenom this season at all. Uh, Profar debuted uh, last weekend. His first at bat hit a home run. But it's a fascinating situation because um, he's a shortstop. And a, a, by all accounts, an outstanding defensive shortstop. Of course, the Rangers already have one of those. They have an all-star shortstop and a very good fielder um, in Elvis Andrus. Uh, so uh, I wrote about this uh, uh, for Tuesday. Uh, what should the Rangers do with their two great uh, young shortstops? It's a, it's a good problem to have, but I, the, uh, the one thing I'm pretty sure about is whatever they do, it'll probably – they'll probably end up not getting value back for whatever they do. If they trade Andrus, which is most likely a uh, scenario, uh, they're going to be trading him without tons of leverage. I'm sure there'll be a lot of teams fighting for him, so that'll, that'll give him some leverage. But it'll be hard to get value back for Andrus for a few different reasons. One, it's, you know, he's already good, and you're going to be getting back probably prospects or something like that, that who are a little bit more uncertain. But also, Andrus' value is a little bit harder to see. It's a little bit harder to sell to... Uh, an owner or a fan base in that you know it's it's defensive based, um, so I just can't see the the Rangers getting back a package uh, like they got back for Teixeira or, or something like that, where it's just all sorts of riches coming back in, and that will probably mean that in in the future when we look back at it, the team that <clears throat> acquires Andrus is probably the team that's going to look like the winner because they're getting the sure thing, the the really good player in the deal. Yeah, th that's that's certainly. I can certainly see them trading Andrus and, and giving the job to Profar, if not in 2013 and 2000, then, then in 2014. Um, they don't have to make a decision this winter. Profar hasn't played in AAA yet. Um, I'm not sure he's ready to be a, a good hitter in the majors yet. A good enough hitter for a shortstop, sure, but not to the point where he, you, you feel like an idiot if you don't play him in the majors right now. I think one of the things that, that this sort of points to 
is the danger. We preach this all the time. Uh, teams still do it. The danger of, of, of these super long-term contracts. Ian right. Kinsler is signed through 2017. If Kinsler wasn't signed to a mega deal, um, they could simply move Profar, or for that matter, Andrus, to second base. I'm not saying that's the best way to use your resources, but you could do it. Um, right. It's hard to see Kinsler going anywhere else. I mean, he, his offense doesn't profile at first base or DH. Yeah, I could see. I would still think Kinsler has a little bit of trade value. He, he's uh, he's not that expensive, and and he probably still has at least you know two, three more years at second base. Uh, I would think before he has to move to a different position. Uh, so I don't think it's it's quite as impossible to move him. Uh, you know, he'll probably have. 10, 10, five rights by the time they're thinking about moving them. But like you said, that that's not something they're going to have to deal with this offseason. It's probably going to be something in 2014. And by then, you know, who knows what could happen. The injuries, players might slump and, and take their, their way out of the lineup. So it, it's probably a little bit premature, but they'll they'll have an interesting decision to make. It's it's going to be one of those kind of McCovey Cepeda or in recent times, uh, Jim Tomei. Uh, Ryan Howard kind of decisions, and it'll be interesting to see you know how it how it holds up. Next topic: Ryan Braun, who's having a phenomenal season, um, arguably just as as he's playing just as well as he played last year when he won the MVP award. Now, granted, uh, it helped his chances last year that the Brewers uh, made the playoffs. It's difficult for any player to win uh, an MVP award. This team is at least competitive for a playoff spot, and the Brewers haven't been uh, this season. But I think very quietly, uh, Braun has established himself as, as uh, one of the great hitters in the game, now having done it two or three years in a row, and also as a legitimate MVP candidate. What do you think, Grant? Yeah, I think the, the main hurdle for him is going to be that the Brewers are kind of lousy, and I don't think that's a hurdle he can overcome. Uh, I don't think he has much of a shot unless you know either the the brewers do something crazy which they're not um either braun uh wins the triple crown which he can't um because milky cabrera has it pretty pretty locked up uh i think braun would have to hit something like 500 for the rest of the season to catch milky uh who, who doesn't have a chance to regress because he's been suspended by uh, or suspended um, so it's gonna it's gonna come down to braun you know having a september that is so insane and so uh, just completely uh, out of control that he raises his numbers up, maybe, maybe gets to 50 home runs, maybe has 130 RPIs, maybe becomes a 50-30 guy. Uh, you know, he still has a shot if he could do something like that that makes people forget that the Brewers are lousy. But right now it looks like Braun is going to be hurt, you know, for a couple different things. You know, the testosterone scandals sort of thing that happened last December for one, but all, mostly the Brewers being lousy. Well, and I, I agree, but I think you're right that the, I think the testosterone thing, um, alleged, um, whatever you want to call it, is going to hurt him a little bit if it even came to that. Um, I wonder if the Pirates falling off the pace is, is going to hurt McCutcheon's candidacy as well. Might open things up for, uh, for Posey. I mean, he seems like the best candidate at this point, aside from McCutcheon. Um, oddly, some of the, be the best players this year are not on playoff teams. David Wright is having a great year. Uh, McCutcheon probably won't be in the playoffs. Braun won't be. Michael Bourne having a great year, but nobody notices. Um, uh, Buster Posey, I, I think he's sort of a, a late-season dark, dark horse candidate. Um, and I wouldn't be all that surprised to see him win it if the Giants make the playoffs, which it looks like they will. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, for Posey to win it, it would have to be the Giants making the playoffs. I think... The catcher position is so you know inextricably linked to a team success, whether you know real or imagined. That if the Giants don't make the playoffs, you're not going to give the MVP to their field general, you know, for for whatever reason. But I think if they make the playoffs, I think Posey is becoming a favorite, especially with McCutcheon, you know, not hitting 350, you know, kind of sliding back to the player he was before. I think Posey's got a lot of things going for him. He he's a good story as far as coming back from the injury. Uh, he plays that sort of intangibly delicious position, a catcher. Uh, so I think he's right now, he's probably, I would probably peg him as the favorite, um, but it really does depend on if the Giants make the playoffs or not. 
Yeah, I think McCutcheon is still the favorite, but definitely his stock is falling quickly. Um, and Posey, 330, batting average, going to drive in 100 runs, plays catcher. I, I think that uh, he's a strong two, and uh, uh, he'd probably get my vote at the moment, even though his wins of replacement is a little lower than the other guys. When you factor in the playing time, catching thing, um, he's a fantastic candidate. Uh, well, that'll do it for this week. Uh, again, uh, this is the Baseball Nation show on SB Nation's YouTube channel. If you've got a question for Grant or I for next week, we would love to answer it. Um, you can check out um, our Twitter account, at SBN Baseball. So you want to send your questions to us there. Use the hashtag Baseball Show. So until next week, I am Rob Nyer. And I'm Grant Brisby, and we will see you next week.